those who this word is intended for today will receive it. I just pray that those who this word is intended for today will receive it. So thank you. Thank you, technicians, for doing all you can to make it happen. I do understand that just some things beyond our control. And so uh, but we do thank God for we have, uh, that we have the flexibility of uh, being online and on, on the call. Thank you so much. We continue in our series today uh, uh, as we've been in the last two weeks talking about lessons from the Lord's Prayer. Lessons from the Lord's Prayer. This is part three of that series. And I hope today that uh, if you just get this for the first time, uh, you can go on our website, whbchurch.org, and you can see and listen to the first two in this series, part one and part two. Today I want to draw your attention to uh, one verse in chapter 6 of Matthew, one verse, and that is verse 12. Verse 12. We simply say this, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts. There is some tr translation we use the word, the, the word transgression uh, or trespass or sin. All right, and we talk about those in the in the uh, body of, of the of the of the lesson. But I'm reading from the NIV, and it says, "Forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors." We started this series by making a bold declaration, a bold declaration that God is. We started this series by saying all prayers are addressed to God. All prayers. We address all prayers to God. Right? And when we looked at this first uh, 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 part, we talked about God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. We said that this model prayer, which in, in, in and of itself is really not a prayer, but an outline of how Christ taught his disciples, meaning us, how to outline our prayer. If you read Matthew uh, chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, when you get to verse 9, Jesus says to his disciples, and this is how. You should pray. Underline the word how. Not this is what you should pray, but how. Obviously, whenever we hear the word how, it speaks about a process. All right? So we, we said in the beginning of this lesson that the Lord's Prayer, as we know it in Matthew chapter 6, which really is the model's prayer, because the Lord's Prayer actually is in John chapter 17. If you really want to hear the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples, for the church, and for the world, go to John chapter 17, and you get that. That is the Lord's Prayer. But what we find here in Matthew is the model's prayer of how God, through Christ, intends for the church, meaning you and myself, how we outline our prayers. All right? And so today, having talked about the... Uh, the kingdom of God, the name of God, and the will of God, we want to talk about who we are in relation to God. You look at this prayer, this prayer, just how it speaks of three things concerning God, it also speaks about three things concerning us. On last week, we talked about give us this day our daily bread. We talked about God's provision for us. God's provision for us. Today, we want to talk about forgive us. We're going to be asking God to forgive us. In other words, we're asking God to pardon us. So there are three people when to come to us. We want to talk about God's provision, which we talked about last week. Today, we want to talk about God's pardon. And next week, we're going to talk about God's protection. All right? So, so these are the, 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 the kinds of things I want you to to embrace when you learn about the Lord's Prayer. So let's jump right into it and, and look at this whole 
meaning of what it is to forgive. All right? Now, when we speak about forgiveness, we are speaking about God's, God's grace to pardon us from things we've done against God. Now, I said earlier that in, depending on the translation you are reading, it will either say forgive us our debts, it will either say forgive us our trespasses, it will either say forgive us from our transgressions, or it could say forgive us from our sins. All right? Now, let's understand what the word forgive means. The word forgive. Psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. All right. This word in general term forgiveness simply means, according to psychologists, uh, says that uh, it's the process whereby you release someone uh, from, from, from all that they have done to you, no matter how bad that thing was. It's to release them from it, even though in your mind they don't deserve to be released from it. All right? Forgiveness has to do more with you than it has to do with the other individual. Now, within the context of the Bible, within the context of the Bible, forgiveness simply means to, to wipe the slate clean. It's like almost, just, just picture yourself, uh, if, if you're a teacher, or, or those of you who, who uh, do seminars and workshops, just picture yourself before a whiteboard, all right, on which you have uh, written some words, and you then take the eraser and clean it, removed it. That's what forgiveness really is in the Bible context. It's to remove all of the stain that we have caused to tarnish the relationship between us and God. God's forgiving spirit come and removes that from it. Now, in talking about forgiveness between us, it's the same thing. It is us releasing those who have caused us hurt and harm. Now, let us understand what forgiveness is not. All right? According to Donna Neal, if you want to check her out, D-A-N-A-N-E-E-L, Donna Neal. According to, uh, to Donna, forgiveness is not ignoring, disregarding, tolerating, excusing, overlooking, or closing one's eye to the sin of the other. It is not letting pass, letting time pass after the offense has been committed and then just getting over it. It is not resigning oneself to the other person's sinful action by saying, well, that's just who he is, or that's just who she is. It is not letting things roll off our backs, or just agreeing to make a first start without confronting the problem. To engage in these behavior may not only condone sin, but also perpetuate it. And as Christians, we are forbidden to do so. So according to Tadana, uh, when we look at engaging in forgiveness, it, it's just not to pretend as if something didn't happen. Because in order to forgive someone, you have to acknowledge that something happened. You have to agree, you, come, you have to come to that conclusion yourself to say, some wrong was done against me. That the Bible says we are to forgive as God has forgiven us. Uh, Ephesians says it well. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God through Christ has forgiven you. Colossians 3.13 says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, if any person have a quarrel against the other, even as Christ forgave you, you also ought to forgive the other. Now, this is one of those things in, in, in Christian discipleship that is very difficult at times. The Bible says several things about the benefits of forgiving. The first it says that what? We forgive because first we have been forgiven by God. It also says we forgive in obedience to God's command. It also goes on to say that we forgive others so that we, we, get, we gain control of our own lives. As I said earlier, forgiveness, my friends, is more about you. It more, it's more about me than the other. Because when we release that person, all right, we release that group, we say to ourselves, I acknowledge the wrong, but I'm willing to walk away from it. I, I know you harmed me. I know what you did to me was not right. I know it was not. I acknowledge it. You may not, but I acknowledge it. And so I'm going to free myself of this burden of walking around with all of this hurt, you know, bottled up in me. And so I'm going to free myself. So you, you release yourself as you release the other. Now, they may never come to recognize that. But the fact of the matter is, you can walk into that space, you can walk into that room with that individual or those individuals and, and, and feel okay because you have liberated yourself. Now understand, understand that forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting the harm that was done to you. It doesn't mean that. There are some hurt and harm that we would take to our grave, that we would never be able to, to forget, even though we may have forgiven the individual, but we would never be able to forget. So, so what does it mean when we say uh, you can forgive, but you can't forget? I know people talk about forgive and forget. That's not always humanly possible. But when we talk about uh, forgetfulness, we, we are saying that, that once I forgive this individual, now listen to me, that, that once I have forgiven a particular individual, all right, whatever I intend to do with that individual going forward should not be influenced by what was done to me. In other words, I should not recall into the present that which was done in the past. So I, I deal with this individual because I've given this individual a new slit. Not forgetting what was done, but saying that if I am to continue into a relationship, then I need to let the past be the past. I understand now, understand all forgiveness will not lead to reconciliation. There's two different things here. All right? You can forgive without reconciling. All right? There's nothing in the Bible that commands us to stay in relationship after we have forgiven that individual. All right? Because here is this. There are some individuals, no matter how many times you forgive them, will never change into the individual that you want them to be or that God intended for them to be. And so when we speak about forgiving each other, we come to that, uh, to that standpoint uh, knowing full and well that God has given us the power to overcome that hurt or that, 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 
that sting, that harm that was caused to you as an individual. But it's dependent on you. The person does not even have to accept your forgiveness. They don't even have to acknowledge it. They may not even acknowledge you. But again, you have to forgive to release yourself. Of all of that burden of going around, walking into a room, and you're so uneasy because the person is there. I know it's not easy. But just how God invites us to love one another, he invites us to forgive one another. Now, there's something interesting about this, this way this verse uh, most of us have learned to recite this upline. We always say, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But when you read it in the NIV, which is the way I like to read it, uh, apparently uh, something was lost in translation from the original language to how we learn this in the King James. All right? The King James says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. All right? When you read it that way, Tony, it suggests that we are in the process of forgiving. All right? When you go back and read it in the modern translation, they have done a lot of linguistics analysis from the original language, it changes. Rather than it saying, as we, meaning getting into the process, it speaks of it in the past. It says, forgive us our debt, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And so, uh, the, the more you study the original language, the more you become aware of what the Bible seeks to teach us. And so, Christ is saying, uh, and this is important, huh? Christ is, is saying to us that just how we seek forgiveness from God, and just how God will forgive us, it is based on us having Forgiven. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you've never experienced hunger, you never know what a hungry man is going through. If you never experienced divorce, you would never know what the, the, the children uh, experience from the breakout of their families. If you've never been fired from your job, you will never experience the pain to go home and face your family knowing that you guys just might become homeless because you just lost your job. Meaning, if you never experience something, you can't share that experience. I hope I'm making sense. And so the Bible uh, suggests that, that you will never experience the value of God's forgiving you if you haven't forgiven some of them. If you haven't first forgiven, how will you, how will you value God's forgiveness? We take for granted things that have not affected us. We take for granted. It's just like we've taken for granted that, that worship will always be in person every Sunday. We took coming into this place for granted. We took standing here preaching for granted. Not that we didn't respect it, but we just believe that if it's Sunday, there will be in-person worship. And we've realized that we cannot take everything for granted. Because as long as we haven't gone through something, we never know how to appreciate the outcome. It's like 
coming to a funeral. If you haven't lost a husband, you don't know how to identify with a widow. If you haven't buried a child, you never know how to identify with that parent. You can have empathy. This is just a sense of us. We can have empathy. We can even have sympathy. But having compassion is a different thing. You have compassion when you have suffered along with that person. And so this verse makes sense to me when I read it in this new context that says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And so we celebrate this verse today, knowing that we have clarity, that, that our forgiveness from God is not based on us, but it's based on God. Just how the forgiveness of the one who caused you harm is not based on them, but it's based on you. And this is difficult. This is difficult. Because there are some hurts that just can't go away. There are levels of hurt that would never go away. But the Bible goes on as, as we, we talk about this word forgiveness. Even Jesus' disciples were concerned about forgiveness. When Peter said to Jesus, okay now Lord, I understand that, that we must forgive, but how, how many times should I forgive this brother? Seven times. And Jesus said, no. Seven to seven times. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't intend for us to start counting. The point Jesus was making was that you keep forgiving as long as the sin continues to occur. In other words, Jesus will always forgive us. Now, it doesn't mean, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that you just live in your sin because God will always forgive you. Now, he will, but that's not what I'm suggesting. Because Paul even raised that question, Paul said, shall I continue in sin just because I have grace? No, God forbid. Yes. But when I'm weak, he gives me strength. Yes. When I'm down, he lifts me up. When I'm confused, he gives me direction. God is with us. And so Christ says to his disciples, no, not seven times, Peter. In other words, forgive as long as there is a reason to forgive. My friends, God's call on us to forgive helps us in our walk with him. Because there are things that, that we do that requires forgiveness. And so as we seek to engage others and seek to remain in right relationship with God, let us know that it's important to forgive because when we forgive, we can restore and repair damaged relationships. We can restore and repair damaged relationships. When we forgive, we, we release Personal anger. There's no need for us to be angry after we've gone through this process of forgiveness. When we forgive, we can also uh, restore fellowship. Again, I said earlier, all forgiveness will not lead to the restoration of fellowship. But there are some fellowship that will be restored because you have forgiven. understand this understand this whenever you are not in right relationship with the other whether it's your spouse whether it's your child your co-worker your friend there there is something that that, that, that creates a void there's something that creates within you that every time, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like uh, a retired fireman. 
that every time he hears that fire truck goes by, something rings a bell. Every time. Because his entire life is tied with his career of being a fireman. But whenever we are not in right relationship with each other, every time we see that one, something goes off in us. Something goes off. It either could be memories or anger. And, and so why allow the presence or the action of the other to cause you to, 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 to stay in perpetual anger? Why have somebody, why give somebody that kind of control over your life? When you can do the best thing for yourself and ask God to give you the spirit and the will and the power to release that person from your life. Don't, don't, don't imprison yourself. Because here is, here is the tragic, the tragic experience in all of this. While you are angry over that person, he or she may have gone on with their lives and you are left still trying to figure out what you're going to do with yours. God offers you a remedy today. God offers you a remedy. He says, forgive, let go, release yourself, embrace your new life. Cherish this moment. What has happened, has happened. If it's a relationship that you believe needs to be restored, God will give you the will and the power to restore that relationship. But there's some relationship that doesn't need to be restored. Let them go. Let it go. Release them from your life. And ask God to give you the will and the power. To embrace your new beginning and walk in the sunlight of God's grace. Knowing that God's grace is sufficient because when you carry with you that hurt, that disappointment, you only carry along with you a hard attack that is waiting to happen. And God wants to release you from that. But you have to trust God. You have to trust God and say, God, I need to walk away from this relationship. I need to forgive and let go. But God says to you that I will always be with you. He said, I will always forgive you. Because the Bible reminds us that while we were yet sinners, the Bible reminds us. Ah, uh, the Bible lets us know that while we were yet sinners, uh, that God allowed Jesus to die for the ungodly, to die for the unrighteous. Ah, uh, those words may, may be so distant from you, but let me let me personalize it. That while you, that while I was still sinning. God allowed Christ to go on Calvary's cross, stretch his hands and die for you and die for me. Ah, the Bible goes on to say that, that very rarely will someone die for a righteous person. But for you, for me, who have walked away from God, God died for us to bring us back in right relationship. And so I leave these words with, from Paul with you. These words that I hope you will hold true. These words that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. In chapter 12, beginning at verse 14, he says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless 
and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinions. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all persons. Verse 18 says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. Beloved, do not advance yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on the hedge. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil overcome evil by doing good. May God bless the word today. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for your word. We pray that it was an encouragement to someone who listened. We pray, oh God, that the word will uh, move us to restore broken relationships. We pray that it will free us from whatever hurt, harm we may be harboring our own hearts. We pray, Father, that the word will push us to that place where we will forgive others and somehow even forgive ourselves. And, oh God, if we have caused hurt against someone else, we pray that you will give us the spirit to acknowledge that hurt and go to that one and say, I'm sorry. We pray, Father, whatever has kept us away from you, this word will help us to come even closer forgive us this day O oh God as we have forgiven others forgive us this day O oh God as we will forgive others forgive us this day O oh God because we have sinned against you give us the heart to forgive the spirit to receive forgiveness and the wisdom to hold true to your word in Christ's name we pray amen I pray that this word was an encouragement to you. And as we move into a time of celebrating the Lord's Supper, I pray that you have your elements with you and that this Lord's Supper will remind you of the sacrificial life of Jesus Christ, who, because he desires to forgive us, shed his blood, allow his body to be broken for you and for me. Come now to celebrate this feast of love, the Lord's Supper. Bible teaches us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed he took bread and after giving thanks he broke it and shared with his disciples and said this bread represents my body we shall be broken for you each of you eat of it and as often as you do remember my death remember my sufferings until I return. In like manner, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he blessed it. He said, this cup 
represents my blood, we shall be shared for the remission of sin. Take each of you and drink of it. He said, for I will no longer eat of this bread or drink of this cup with you until that day when we all should gather in my Father's kingdom. As you prepare your hearts to participate in this Lord's Supper, we invite Deacon John Limas to come and pray over the elements. We invite you to pray along with us that this will be a special time in your family, a special time in your life as we reflect on the goodness of God. But look forward to God's glorious return when he come to receive his church and to take us to be with him and live with him all eternity. Let's pray with Deacon Lydus. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We ask you, Lord, that as we are about to partake in your Holy Communion, we just ask you, Lord, to continue to bless us as a family, as a church. We ask you, Lord, to bless the elements that we are about to take. We ask you to bless the bread and bless the wine. We ask you to change it from its physical form to a holy form, Jesus. As we eat and as we drink, may we reflect on your death and resurrection for our sins. We just thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Broken for your sins and mine. Let us eat together. cup that represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, that bled for you and for me. Let us drink together. The Bible said when supper was ended, Jesus and his disciples, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And there he found a place in the garden called Gethsemane. He knelt and prayed for hours. The Bible says that the prayer was so intense that, that the very perspiration came from the head of Christ it was as if they were drops of blood. We all know what that famous prayer was. Lord, Lord, let this cup pass, but not my will, but yours be done. It is my prayer for each of you today, my brothers and my sisters, that as you go out into the highway and byways of your life, that your prayer will be, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. But the grace of God be with you. But the providence of God surround you. But the love of God uphold you. And may the mercy of God forgive you. Until we connect again, be safe and good night.